chat together. Uh, if you've got a, a, a collection of ancient documents there that we call the Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25 this morning. Matthew 25. I want to just share a few thoughts with us. For the next couple of weeks, I want to preach out of Matthew 25. You would know this passage as the parable of the talents. Anyone ever heard of the parable of the talents? Yep. Long story. I'm going to read it to you in a second. Um, but just to let you know, the next two weeks I want to speak about it. I want to um, uh, just plant a couple of thoughts in your mind first this week that hopefully you can go away with and you can think about. And when you come back next week, I want to take those thoughts another step uh, further. Uh, and and uh, hopefully out of that. You know, how many of you were here um, when we came back from COVID, I think it was, and we talked about our kind of ethos, I guess, here at Arise. We've got four key words. Anyone remember what those four key words were? Faith, correct? First one is faith. You need to come to know Jesus. You need to come into a living relationship with God. When you do, that's when uh, the Holy Spirit fills you. That's when the Christian life takes on uh, purpose, meaning that's when you get a bit of momentum, that, that initial decision to follow after Jesus. First word was faith. What was the second one? It w- hey? Begins with F. You're halfway there. Freedom. Second one was freedom. Once we come to faith, then we begin to work with God. We get, begin to dive into these ancient documents, this teaching about life. How does God see life? What does God think about things? Because before I came to him, I thought about life a certain way. Now I come to faith, I realize that God has a better way of doing things. And it's not exactly the same way as the way I used to do things. So God begins to work in my life, begins to transform me, change me. I, I renew my mind through the word of God so that I start thinking a bit more the way God wants me to. So I can uh, uh, live this life the way that he wants me to. And in doing that uh, I might come up against roadblocks things uh, false beliefs about myself pains hurts disappointments stuff from the past that are holding me back and God through the Holy Spirit just gently uh, works with me and, I, and I, I come into places of healing and freedom so the second word there was freedom after we as, as we get free we then begin to get focused focused well done Rod you're about to say it I could tell you had the F already formed he was going to say focus the third word was focus So we come to faith, then we begin to, to, God begins to work in us, we begin to find levels of freedom. When we find those levels of freedom, then we begin to find focus. Focus is where we begin to ask the question and find answers for the question, what am I here for, God? Lord, what is it about me that you have placed in me that is meant to make a difference? Because how many of you believe that we're all here and the time that we've got here on planet Earth, you could have been born in another generation, in another country, at another time. You could have been born anywhere in human history for whatever reason God decided to send you here now. Isn't that awesome? He puts you here now and there's a reason and a purpose and a, a divine inspiration behind that. So focus is about trying to discover what is that thing, God, that you've got me here for. When I, when, I, when I pass through this life and I get to the other end, what is that fingerprint that you want me to leave here, God? What is that piece of your DNA that's been invested in me that you want me to leave behind? Then the final one is fruit. Someone said fruit over here. Who said fruit? If I had a Mars bar, I'd throw it at you right now, but it probably might hit the child. I'm not a good shot with Mars bars from that far. However, fruit, exactly. Once we find focus, then we begin to actually do things. How many of you know the Christian life is not about what we know? Anyone aware of that? It's not about knowledge. If you're sitting here this morning going, I can't wait to get another bit of information about God, it's not going to change you. Transformation and change comes not by information. It comes when we outwork that stuff, when we begin to do things like the, the wise and the foolish builder. If you read that, that parable that Jesus taught, they're both sitting there. I can tell you right now, if Jesus was here, he would say, there's a wise builder and a foolish builder. You're sitting in this building right now and you're listening to everything that I've got to say. And the difference at the end of the day is one house was built and withstood the storm. Storms came to the wise and the foolish. The floods came against the wise and the foolish. They both built a house, the wise and the foolish. One stood, one fell. What was the difference? Jesus says, the one that was wise where his house stood, he heard the words of Jesus and he did them. The other one just heard it and went, that's great advice, great information, love it, awesome. I'll take notes on it, but I'm still going to go and do whatever it is that I want to do. And when the storms came, his house fell. The difference was what they did. And when we do what God calls us to do, we begin to see fruit in our life. That's the, 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 the kind of ethos, I guess, of, of our gathering and why we're, we're here together. I want to uh, uh, sort of talk this morning about gifts and talents. Now, I don't want you to think, I don't know what my gift is. Put the question out of your head. I don't know what my talent is. Put the question out of your head. I don't want you to begin digging around trying to find what... I want you to put all that just out of your head at the moment. Because the answer to that question is not as hard as as you think it is. 
I think we've overcomplicated some of these things in, in the life of Christianity. And I'm hoping over the next couple of weeks we can just simplify some of those things. But I want to start with a very simple couple of thoughts this morning and a couple of questions. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And the one he gave five talents to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents, came and bought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Hey, look, I've gained five more talents besides the, the five you gave me. The Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. And look, I've got two more talents besides the ones you gave me. And his Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. The Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10. But everyone who has more will be given. He'll have an abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has, it'll be taken away from him. And what's what he called that wicked lazy servant? Cast the unprofitable, unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now, would you open our eyes to see whatever it is that you want to say to each of us here as individuals. Speak a language that each individual here understands this morning. God, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to give you two thoughts about this parable. And next week, I want to unpack a bit more about this whole concept and idea of talents, gifts. Call them whatever you want. But how many of you have been told or thought or led to believe that you have a gift? Yep, yep. I have gifts, you have gifts. I understand the mentality of gifts, but here's, here's, here's what I want to say to you this morning. I want to say this to you. Rather than thinking that God has given you a gift... What if we flick that switch a little bit and we say this, God has invested something in you. God has invested something in you. Anyone ever made a bad investment in their life? Anyone ever, ever made a bad investment? Hands up if you've made a bad investment. Okay, everyone else look around. Don't talk to them about investments. They've made bad. That's not true. I bet you for every bad investment you've made, you've made a whole ton of really good investments. I'm, I've made some bad, uh, what you would call, investments in life. And I don't mean I'm a stock market person. I'm not. But I do remember years ago I, I resigned from, um, I was actually pastoring at the time, and I resigned from a job, and uh, I couldn't find work anywhere. So here's what I did. <laughs> a friend of mine said, hey, here's this great online business. All you've got to do is pay uh, X amount of exorbitant dollars and they'll give you a password and you're in and then you build a website and then all you got to do is go out there I and mean, it's so simple you just print up flyers drop them in people's letterboxes and they start buying stuff off you it's that simple anyone tried to start a business like that it's so simple isn't it you just open a website get some flyers do a letterbox drop and the dollars roll in has that been anyone's experience in this room no that's why I'm telling you I made a bad investment one day I went and paid the fee. I got the website done. I paid for printing, all this stuff. I walked around Skinner's Head in Ballina because I knew that's where the money was. So I walked around Skinner's and did all my letterbox drops, went back home, clicked on the website and just sat there with the calculator ready to count. Three months later, guess how much money I made? Not a single dollar. Guess how much money I invested to try to make no dollars? I'm not going to tell you, but it was a lot. Uh, uh, my wife said, I'm not going to tell you. 
It was a lot of money. It was a bad investment. It was a bad investment. I want to say to you that God's invested some things in you. And the good news is this. God doesn't make bad investments. Who believes that God doesn't make bad investments? God's not as stupid as me. He's not as silly as me. He's not as moved by emotion as me. God is well thought out, well planned. Not only that, God understands the market better than I do. God understands what's going to happen better than I do, what has happened better than I do, the patterns and everything better than you and better than me. Because of that, God has never, ever made a bad investment in his life. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say that God will never make a bad investment because he just knows too much inside information about whatever it is. And here's the thing. God has invested things in you. And if God's invested things in you, but God's never made a bad investment, that means that you must be pretty good. That means that God, the one that's invested something in you, must have a great deal of faith in you. God must have a great deal of faith in you. Ever thought about that? I know we have faith in God. I'm always challenging people, have faith in God. You're going to have, and I believe that with all my heart. We're going to have faith in God and trust in God, belief in God and so on. But how many of you know that, that it's a really empowering thought when somebody has faith in you? Anyone ever had somebody in their world and they just had faith in you? Somebody that really trusted in you, that gave you a chance, gave you an opportunity, believed in you. And what did that do for you as a person? There's probably many people sitting here this morning and you probably wouldn't be the person you were if someone didn't believe in you at some point in your life, whether it be a parent, whether it be a teacher. Maybe it was a person sitting in church with you. Maybe it was a sporting coach. Maybe it was a lecturer at university. Maybe it was an employer or a boss. Somebody that believed in you, saw something in you and gave you an opportunity based on what they saw in you. Someone who believed in you. Who's ever had someone believe in them? I, I can still remember at 19 years of age, I've just become a Christian, right? I've just become a believer. And six months later, I'm off in this organisation called Youth with a Mission. Um, I did a training school. I was still messed up. I still didn't really know up from down, but I was just, I love Jesus. That's all that mattered. And I, I'm, I remember uh, going on an outreach with a, a guy. We, we jumped in a van and we drove out to a little place called Laidley. Anyone know Laidley? on the way to Toowoomba. Anyone ever been to Laidley? Tiny little town. I think they had massive floods some years back. And Well, anyway, there was a little <coughs> um, church there, little uniting church, and I still remember the day that I, I got to go to Laidley. And I was the bus driver. I just drove the bus. That's what I did. And I loved driving the bus because everyone else would do the stuff. And I drove. And we drove out to Laidley. And I remember we were at this little youth group. And this, this, the, the, the guy that was leading the team had been sort of ministering for a long time. And with about... oh. 20 minutes before someone was supposed to share with about, it was only about seven young people in a youth group. And the guy that was leading the team, he taps me on the shoulder and he says to me, Alan, I want you to share something with this youth group. Now, let me tell you something. The first thing I did when he said that, and this is true, I went straight to the toilet. I did. I, I, I looked at him, I turned around, I went straight to the toilet and I had this unbelievable discussion with God while I was in there about why this was dumb and I shouldn't do it and so on. Look, cut a long story short without going into the ins and outs of it. I can look back to that moment and I see a man who saw something in me and he invested in me an opportunity to do something that had little things like that not happen. Who knows whether I'd be standing here today. And there's something empowering about knowing that somebody believes in you. Something empowering about it. Well, how much more empowering would it be if you and I actually believed that God has faith in you? God actually has faith in you. That's one of the foundational things that you see in this parable. It says that a man had goods. It says the kingdom of God is like a man who has goods. The parables that Jesus teaches, parables are like principles. It's like Jesus says, I'm going to give you a story. And in that story, there are principles about how life operates in the kingdom of God. There are principles about how life operates when you put your faith in me and you live life the way I call you to live it. There are principles. And, and he begins to teach these parables that have these principles. And one of the things he says in this parable is that the kingdom is like a man who, who gives whose goods? Who gives his goods. So this man owns the goods. He owns the, the talents. He owns that which he's distributing to his people. He owns them. Matter of fact, not only does he own them then when he gives them, if you go, I think it's verse 19. Let me read it to you. I think verse 19 it says that when he comes back, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So you don't go back to somebody to settle accounts if you've just given it to them and you're not expecting anything. 
So here's this master who's investing something into these people. He must have had faith in them. He must have believed in them. And he must have actually not only just had faith in them, but he had faith in their capacity and their ability to use whatever it was that he gave them and produce something. Isn't that an amazing thought? God has faith in you. The, the king of the universe has invested things in you. Now, here's the thing. What we see here is not a master giving a gift. We see a master making an investment. Making an investment. And when you make an investment, you expect a return on that investment, do you not? You expect that at the end of the day, the guy that gave it is giving it because he believes that if I put it there, there's something that I'll get back out of this. There'll be a return on my investment. And God, the master in this parable, says, I'll give to you because I actually believe. I've got faith. I've got faith in you that you can take what I've given you and that you can do something really, really great with it, really positive with it. And that at the end of the day, when I come back, that there will be a return on that which I've invested in you. God has faith in you. And God doesn't make bad investments. But here's the thing. If you see it as a gift, what does that mean? Let me tell you what it means if it's a gift. Once you've got it, do whatever you want with it. Is that right? How many of you, you get given gifts? How many of you love it when someone gives you a gift, but you know there's an expectation on that? Is that a gift? Of course it's not a gift. It's not a gift. We call them, um, you know, Indian givers always say there's strings attached. There's strings attached to that. And so often, I've had gifts given to me with strings attached. So you know what I do? I don't take the gift. I just give it back. I don't want, it's not a gift. If there's strings attached to it, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. You're trying to get something out of me. Well, it says here that what the master invested in, he didn't give it to them as a gift. It's an investment. But you see, if you see it as a gift then you can have that which the master invested in you, the master gave you, but it can stop with you and there's zero consequence. That's all that matters. But it doesn't say here that he gave them anything. It actually says that he invested something in them with an expectation of a return. My uncle, I don't know, I've shared this story before several years ago. My uncle, uh, a long time ago actually, when I was a little kid, my uncle at Christmas time uh, came to, to a little town called Baradine where we were having, uh, my, my, we had some property there, my, my grandparents, and, and we went down to Baradine. Debbie's laughing because she knows Baradine. She blinked once and had to drive back to see it. And um, so here we are in Baradine, and my uncle rocks up, and it's Christmas, and we get our Christmas gifts, and you know what it's like at Christmas, you rip it open, you can't wait to see the gift. Well, he didn't even open it, he just put them near him, and then when he left a couple of days later, put them in the boot of his car and drove off without even opening the gift, without even opening the presents, taking the wrapping paper off. And 12 months later, we ended up at a place where, um, where he was again, same place, and I remember being excited because he was one of my favourite uncles when I was a kid, and I ran down, and he's, he's, he's getting his bag out of the car, and he pops the boot, and there in the boot of the car are the gifts still unwrapped, just sitting there. He hadn't done anything with them. But you know what? It's okay, because they're his gifts. He can do whatever he wants with them. There's no expectation. And you know what? I think sometimes, let me just throw a thought out there, sometimes, maybe as believers, we see our gifts a little bit the same. We see our talents a little bit the same. They're ours. They're mine. Therefore, I can do whatever it is that I want with them. Maybe I can just use them to build my own kingdom. Maybe I can just use them to build my own portfolio. Maybe I can just use them purely to build my own popularity. Maybe I can use them just to build my own fame and fortune. Maybe I can use them to, to, to do, um, if I want to, I can just bury it in the sand and not even use it if I don't want to. Why? Because it's a gift. And if it's a gift, then it's, it pretty much ends with me. That's it. But what if I started looking at those things in my life as an investment from heaven? What if I looked at some of those things as an investment from God and not just a gift? It changes everything. Because when somebody invests, there is a fair expectation of some kind of return to come back to them. The master in the parable didn't just give them the talents and go away and not come back. Or when he came back, he didn't just come back and say, hey, how you going? Make himself a cup of tea and some toast and move on. It says when he came back, he, he wanted to settle accounts with them. So he gave it to them with the full knowledge that the end game here is that you would take what I've given you and you would do something that's going to give value to me when I return. Not just you, 
but something that's going to add value to me, my purposes, and my plans. In an investment, the giver is expecting a return. Even to the guy that buried it, what did what did the master say to the guy that buried the talent? He said, you, you, you thought I was a hard man. You thought my character was all messed up and, and, and so you didn't want to get in trouble. So he says this, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with at least a bit of interest. At least a bit of interest. Something. Give me something as a return on the investment because I trusted you. I trusted you. And because I trusted you and I believed in you and I gave you something because I wanted a bit of a return on the investment that I placed in you. Our gifts and our talents uh, are not just gifts. They're not gifts in the sense that God gives them to us and that's the end game. I believe that God invests things in people. Think about your, your, your talents and gifts. I don't want you to, to go there. I can't name. Think about the things that you do really well. Think about those things that come natural to you. About those things where you know there's fruit in your life, when you, when, when you, you know, people, you're a good listener, people talk to you. When, when, you, when, you, when you have money, you can turn money into more money. When you play an instrument, you, people are in awe. When you sit down and talk, you just have a capacity to draw out of people. When you communicate, people get it, but otherwise don't get it. All these things, and, and I don't want to go into what a gift is and what a gift isn't. I'm just saying this. Anything that has the potential to produce kingdom fruit, anything that has potential to produce kingdom fruit is an investment. It's an investment into us. We live, breathe, and have our being in God, the, writers, uh, the writer of Acts commented on. There's investment that God has made in you, investment that God has made in me. Why did he make the investment in us? Understand it. Because he actually believes in you. He actually believes in you. God thinks that you're a worthwhile place to invest. Think about that. God thinks that you are a stock worth having. God thinks that you are a property worth buying. God thinks that you are the right place to plant the seed because it's going to grow. God believes in you. You might not believe in you. You might not have a lot of friends who believe in you. Maybe your family don't believe in you. God believes in you. Amen? God has faith in you. God doesn't make bad investments. He doesn't deposit things in people if he knows it's going to go south. He actually trusts you. He trusts you. He thinks that you're a good place to invest into. God believes you're the right place to invest. Now, in verse 15, it says this. It says, To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. Here's a little, little bit of Greek for you. I don't know a lot of Greek, but here's a little bit of Greek for you. You know that word ability? It's the Greek word dunamis. What do you think of when I say the Greek word dunamis? What have you been taught most of your Pentecostal lives? Most of our Pentecostal lives, Acts 1.8, you shall receive power. Dynamite. That's where we get the, the, the root word of our modern word, dynamite, explosive power. Most people brought up in Pentecostal circles, we hear that word and it gets explained to us. It's, it's miracle-working power from God. Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you'll receive power. And, and that's exactly what, is, what the word actually means is inherent uh, power that's inherent within you because of the way that you're actually made. Inherent power within you. Inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. In other words, uh, each of the talents were distributed to people according to their own dunamis. Each w w was distributed to each individual according to the power that was inherent in them. In other words, what it's saying is this. Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you get the power of the Holy Spirit, that which is inherent in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what it means. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you get a whole new set of power, the things that are inherent in the Holy Spirit. But what he's talking about here is that the master looked and said, you've already got some inherent dunamis in you. You've already got a certain amount of ability and power and so on by virtue of the way that I formed and fashioned and made you. And then what the master does is he goes, based on how you are made, I'm going to then give you something to work with based on the way I made you. Based on the way I made you. Here's the good news. You are a perfect fit for who you are. You are a perfect fit for who you are. You don't have to change your personality in order to try to operate in the things that God has got upon your life. You don't have to become somebody else. 
He knew who you were. That's why he gave you what he gave you. He knew that this person could operate with one, so he gave them one. He knew this person could operate with two, so he gave them two. He knew this person operates with five, so he gave them five. Don't look at the amounts. Was God fair? 100%. Let me give you a picture of what fairness is. Let's say I've got Jordan here, who is, 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 is 21 this year. 21? 21 this year. I had to ask. I've got four kids. I'm not great with the numbers, but I was never good at maths. 21 this year. I've got Jordan here who's 21 this year. I've got Chloe up the back, and Chloe is 16. Just turned 16, actually, um, not too long back. So I've got Chloe who's 16, and I've got Jordan who's a 21-year-old um, uh, male uh, with a big appetite, and I've got my beautiful daughter there with probably less of an appetite. Let's say I've got a piece of cake, and I cut that piece of cake, and, and, and I might give Jordan a piece of cake that's actually half the cake, and he would probably still want more. But I would give him half the cake. Jordan, that's half the cake. You, why am I giving him half a cake? Because that's how much it takes to fill his belly and make him feel satisfied. Chloe up the back there, I might cut a quarter of the cake, give it to Chloe. Chloe eats a quarter of the cake, fills her belly, she's satisfied. Am I being fair? Yes, I am being fair. Don't look at the amount of cake they got given. Look at the fact that both ate, were satisfied and were full. That's fairness. Don't look at, oh, the guy that got the one talent is not as good as the guy that got the two, who's not as good as the guy that got the five. That's not what he's saying. I don't give better gifts to people that are better and lesser. It's not about that. It's not about the amounts. Notice the guy that went and traded with the two. What did he do? He doubled it. The guy that traded with the five, he doubled it. They both doubled it. The end game was the same. It's not about amounts. It's not about this gift is better than that gift or this person's better than that person. It's about a God that knows exactly who you are, created you for great things, and that God believes in you so much that he invested into you the perfect gifts, the perfect talents, the perfect things that match your personality to have an outcome where he reaps some kind of reward for the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? God has faith in you. God has belief in you. I, I'm excited about that anyway. I'll tell you that right now. I'm excited that I have a God that not only do I have faith in him, but he has faith in me. As a matter of fact, it's God's faith in me that's much more powerful than my faith in him. Because it's God's faith in me that gives me opportunity. It's God's faith in me that opens his doors. It's God's faith in me that gives me the chance to do some of the things that I do, not my great faith in God. My faith in God can be like this, just like yours. One day it's up, one day it's down. God doesn't have faith like that in you and me. God's faith is stable in us. He believes in us and he believes in you this morning. God has faith in you. God has faith in you even when you don't have faith in yourself. The two-talent man, he didn't sit down and cry because he wasn't given five. He must have trusted that the master knew what he was doing. Now, I wonder this morning, do you actually trust that the master knows what he's doing when it comes to your life? Do you trust that when he made you and fashioned you, he knew what he was doing? Do you trust that with the gifts and talents and things that are on your life right now, do you trust that God knows why he gave them to you? Do you trust that? Or are you waiting to become somebody else? Are you sitting there kicking stones wishing that you could do something else or be somebody else? Until you accept who you are and what you've been given, you will never be able to give God a return on his investment in your life. Let me say that again. Until you accept who you are, and what you've been given, you will never, ever be able to give God a return on the investment that he's placed in your life. God believes in you enough that he not only gave his life for you, but he invests gifts and talents and opportunity in you as well. God invests in you because he's looking for a return. The problem is most of us don't believe in ourselves. Most of us are trying to be something that we're not. Most of us want something that we don't have instead of simply embracing who we are, what we have, where we are, and just stepping out each day into the opportunities that God presents to us. We're not perfect, but God knows that, but he still chose to invest stuff into my life. And God has a fair and honest uh, expectation of some kind of return, not only for my life to look great, but for the kingdom of God to be built down here on earth. See, Moses thought that he wasn't the best choice, but God thought he was worth the investment. I can't speak, Lord. I can't this, I can't that. You're worth the investment, Moses. Gideon thought he wasn't the best choice, but God obviously thought that he was worth the investment. The 12 disciples, when they all ran from Jesus and they saw him from a distance hanging on a cross and they didn't want to associate, you know what? I'll bet you in that moment they all thought that they weren't worth the investment. They weren't the best choice. But Jesus saw otherwise. Jesus saw otherwise. He thought they were the best choice. Here's the reality. The church doesn't exist because of man's great faith in God. The only reason the church exists is because of God's great faith in men and women. 
Church doesn't exist because of your great faith in God. It exists because of God's great faith in us. He believes in us. Jesus, before he left, gathered his disciples together and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I can imagine an angel tapping him on the shoulder and going, are you sure? These guys wouldn't even stand by you in your darkest hour. These guys ran. That nitwit over there, Peter, a little 12-year-old servant girl said, you're one of them, and he blew up deluxe at her. Are you sure? What's your plan B? And Jesus turns to the angel and says, I don't have a plan B. I don't have a plan B. My kingdom will be built on this earth by people, imperfect people, but people that I have great faith in. God has faith in you. The church exists not because of your great faith in God, but God's great faith in you. And if that doesn't stir you up, if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't motivate you to want to wake up in the morning and say, God, here I am, as imperfect as what I am, uh, whether I think I'm in the right place, the wrong place, whether I think I've got the goods or I don't, the truth is I've got oxygen in my lungs today and I'm going to do something today. And wherever I am, you're going to be there and people are going to be there that don't know you, people that need you, people that need to encounter. God, all that stuff's going to happen. So Lord, here I am, send me. Here I am, God, this morning. Would you send me? Would you do something with my life? The church will grow in numbers and influence again when we start believing that God has faith in you. That's my message this morning, nice and simple, nothing deeply profound. But I want you to get up and walk out of here and know this, God has faith in you. Before we talk about talents, before we talk about gifts, who cares about all of that if you don't actually believe that God has faith in you? It's all pointless because you'll, you'll be like that lazy, wicked servant. You'll just dig it and bury it in the ground because, God, I'm not good enough, or God, I don't like what I've got, or God, I... Hey, God got it right. He invested stuff in your world. And when he comes back, he's got a fair thought and a fair expectation of some kind of return, not just for yourself, but for the kingdom of God. Amen? Lord, I want to thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, who you are. God, this morning, thank you, uh, Father, that, uh, Lord, you're doing things in this world around us, God. And Father, mostly this morning, I want to thank you for this. I know my shortcomings. I know my failings. I know my imperfections. I know I don't get it right all the time. I know I fail. I know I fall short. I know I don't know enough. I know that I don't take every opportunity that, gives, that, that you give to me. I know that sometimes I run in the opposite direction when you say go here. I know sometimes I shut my mouth when you say speak. I know sometimes I don't pray and I try to work it out when you say pray. I know all of that stuff. God, as a matter of fact, I know so much of it that it would be easy for me to think that you don't trust me and don't have any faith in me. But when I read your word, God, it's so plain. That's not about my great faith in you. It's your great faith in us. And so, Lord, I pray for each person here. God, I pray that, Father, we would come to a place of peace, of just accepting the fact that you think we're a good investment. God, that's why you have given us life. That's why you have given us breath. God, that's why you have invested talents and skills and abilities. God, that's why, the, why we see things the way we do. It's why we, 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 we function the way we do, God, because you have uniquely created us and deposited stuff in our life. And God, I pray just for each person here this morning, Lord, as we think about this, God, even as the week goes on, as we wake up tomorrow morning, Lord, we wake up with a bit of excitement that God, not kicking stones and thinking that, that, that we're, we're less than we actually are. We're sons and daughters of the King. You love us and you've invested great things in us, Lord. And I pray, God, this week in the next seven days, God, give us opportunities to give you a return, to bring a return on your investment to the kingdom of God around us through what we say, what we do, where we go, Father, through uh, the opportunities and the doors that you open up for us, Father. God, that we would work with you and build the kingdom. And God, just accept that we are beautifully and fearfully and wonderfully made, even though we are works in progress and even though we are imperfect. You love us and we love you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.